The speaker is going to be Corey Anderson, and he's going to talk to us about effects of elevation and microtopography on burrowing intensity of the gopher tortoise at Avon Park Air Force Range in South Central Florida. So I don't get the Tony Robbins microphone? That's not the same. Can't unleash the power. All right, so they say that South Florida is uh, different than North Florida. After my drive down to uh, no man's land, though, I'm not so sure that the differences are all that discreet. Okay, apparently, though, for gopher tortoises, this is more true. And in um, South Florida, they, they occupy suboptimal habitats, or at least habitats that are considered suboptimal in other parts of their range. And the two main habitats that you find them in is something called scrub. Apparently, scrub is harder to find. Um, and also uh, mesic uh, pine flatwoods. And um, uh, there's well-drained sandy soils that are sort of associated with gopher tortoises in scrub habitats. However, in mesic pine flatwoods, um, there's seasonal flooding. Part of it may be permanently flooded and um, you often get burrow inundation. So you often find gopher tortoises in partially flooded burrows. Um, typically, when you're talking about the difference between scrub habitats and uh, flatwoods, pine flatwoods habitats, um, sort of the mantra is that um, there's an elevational gradient and that as elevation decreases, essentially the, the distance to the water table goes up. And then that um, has some effect potentially on gopher tortoise burrowing. However, this is a, an oversimplification in the sense that um, some of the sites, for example, at Avon Park, um, the, the flatwoods actually occur at higher elevations than the scrub. So it's, it's not quite this simple. So this study, we wanted to look at the effect of elevation on burrowing intensity, and we wanted to compare it in some of these different habitats, specifically scrub, pine flatwoods, and then also mixed scrub, uh, pine flatwoods. Um, and I guess that uh, this is a mixture, this, the scrub is actually a mixture of the, what they call scrubby flatwoods, and then also some um, more sort of traditional scrub habitat. Uh, so when we first started to overlay some of the burrows on some of these sites, um, we noticed that, well, if we're going to think about elevation, it's, it's not really all that simple in the sense that there's two forms of elevation on a site like this. You have, and let's see where my laser is. Got my laser. Okay, so you have these gradients in elevation that are associated with sort of general transitions between bottom lens and uplands. But if you squint your eyes, you can see that there's actually sort of slightly raised surfaces um, that represent what we refer to as micro topography. So we have basically variation in elevation relative to sort of the mean elevation. Um, and this micro topography is almost indiscernible from the ground level in, in some of these flatwoods habitats. So there's actually elevation gradients, but with all the vegetation, it's very hard to see. Um, so we wanted to tease apart elevation and not just look at these gradients in elevation, um, but also look at microtopography and its effect on burrowing intensity. Okay, so the study area is Avon Park, which is um, a lot of you probably drove through the city of Avon on uh, Avon Park on your way down here. Um, it's a large uh, DOD facility of over 100,000 acres, and it's got about um, 50,000 potentially habitable um, acres of habitat for gopher tortoises. And this is sort of the breakdown here, the how much pine flatwoods there are, how much scrub there is. Um, and here is just a, a Google um, Earth overview of the field site um, showing also in, in where the actual the study locations are. And you'll see in this talk, I've got sort of a color scheme where the pine flatwood sites are in blue, the scrub sites are in red, and the mixed flatwood scrub sites are in this sort of turquoise color. Okay, so they uh, walk linear transects to find these burrows, spaced five meters apart. When they found a burrow, they recorded the location with the scientific grade GPS. Um, and we're using something here called a small world model. A lot of point pattern analyses basically assume that the spatial distribution of the points extends beyond the sampling window. Um, here, it's a complete survey where basically you find all of the burrows in an area. So there's none that actually extend beyond the, the boundary. Um, and so, uh, to kind of visualize this, you have all of the all borough locations, regardless of their status. Um, this buffer represents essentially they, once they found a borough, they'd look about 100 meters beyond the, 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 the borough to see if there's any other boroughs. And essentially, there's a gap um, that misrepresents where all the boroughs are in that area. 
And then to actually define the analytical window, what I did was I went back in and I uh, reverse buffered it so that the outer edge represents the average nearest neighbor distance between the boroughs. And then I also removed all um, non-habitat that could potentially bias the intensity es estimates. So things like roads or permanently flooded, flooded ponds that you don't find gopher tortoises in, I eliminated that habitat. <clears throat> um, this is just to kind of show you the intensity of burrowing. Um, basically range from about five uh, hect uh, burrows per hectare up to about 10 burrows per hectare. And um, somewhat surprisingly, there is a high intensity of burrowing in these flat wood, ha flat wood habitats um, where you find gopher tortoises. Apparently, um, they're not as common in the flatwoods, but where they do occur, um, they're using those areas very intensively. Okay, so how do we get the elevation data? We're using a, a LIDAR-derived uh, digital elevation model, um, and it was given to us as an Erdis Imagine file, and we converted it in ArcGIS to a tagged image file format, and then we clipped it to the visible extent of each one of these point patterns. I think I've got to go this way. Okay, I don't want to belabor. If you, I have a whole blog written about all the um, the coding and the programming to do all these sorts of conversions. But essentially, with any kind of a study, part of the game is you have to get it into a, an object type or a format type that you can use to do your, your analysis. So um, here we're basically bringing it in and, and creating an object type that we can um, do a point pattern analysis with. Can we end up with something like this where we can over, then overlay the points on top of the um, elevation surface? Okay, now the, the question becomes, you have your points overlaid on your elevation model, um, how do you tease the elevation apart to separate the gradients and elevation from the microtopography? Um, and it turned out that there's not a lot of guidance about how to do this on the internet. You would think that detraining a raster would be a common task, but it's actually, um, there's, there's only actually, I, after I developed my own way of doing it, I found one package where there was a function that, that basically did the same thing that I developed. Um, but what we're doing is we're using something called trend surface modeling. We're basically modeling elevation as a polynomial function. Um, and you can think of it as, say, if it's, uh, if we're, we're modeling the elevation as a function of the X and Y coordinates, I should say, or a polynomial function of the X and Y coordinates. So say something like this is if it's just, say, first degree, it represents something like a linear trend. If we want to bend the surface to sort of capture a more complicated sort of gradients and elevation, we can use something like a, we could add a, a second degree to it to make sort of a quadratic shape. And then we, as we add, um, higher degrees, essentially we can bend the surface more. So something like this would be like a cubic model. Okay, and so what we do is, is I basically fit a polynomial function to the elevation surface. The predicted fit rep represents essentially that gradient in elevation. So this is what's predicted from the, the regression. And then what's left over is the microtopography. So it's basically, and what we don't want to do here is we have to pick a degree polynomial to fit. You don't want to overfit it because if you overfit it, you're basically going to erase or suck up all that microtopography that you're trying to look at. Okay, so this is the two surfaces. Um, and then we can basically rebuild rasters um, from the fitted model and for the residuals, and we can overlay it. And it's a little bit hard to see here, um, but if we sharpen the image, you can see, so this is the, the, the burrow locations overlaid on microtopography on the sharp, a sharpened image. And it's just completely striking to me when I first saw this, because I've been at this point pattern analysis game for a few years now, and I rarely ever see um, something so striking in terms of predictivity where these burrows and these flatwoods, this particular site is called Alexander, you can see that these uh, burrows are essentially high intensity on all of these sort of raised topographic features. Okay, so how do we actually sort of test this um, we're using point process models. I know that sounds like a big word. A big word here also is inhomogeneous Poisson point process. All it is is a log, it's a uh, log linear model. It's a Poisson regression. Our response is the number of burrows per some unit area. And then um, our predictors are some either elevation surface, the raw DEM, the microtopography, the trend, or both together. And we wanted to look at them um, together and separately to kind of see how um, the results change. And what we're doing, since we want a hypothesis test, not do model selection, um, we're using log likelihood ratio tests. And for example, here is a model 
Um, that includes, say, the DEM surface as a predictor, and we're comparing it to a null model. Our null model is what we call CSR, or a homogeneous Poisson process. It basically means that the intensity is constant throughout the area. And we can see here, right, this, we would interpret this as being strong evidence against the null model in favor of the model that includes the elevation predictor. Okay, and so I'm going to summarize all of these log likelihood ratio tests with this little table here. Um, and this is basically significance level, one, two, three stars, as you've seen it, 0 0.05, 0 0.01, 0 0.001. Um, and then also have color here. So color is, I'll show you the regression coefficients in a minute here, but color basically means that um, blue here would be positive effect, red would be negative effect, um, and then mixed would be a mixed positive effect, say, of micro topography and a negative effect of the trend. And what you can see here is that for all but two sites, there's a significant effect of elevation on burrowing intensity. So when you use just the raw DEM. Interestingly, when you just look at the trend in elevation, right, alone, there's only one site that's significant, and it's negative, okay? Microtopography, there's a significant effect of microtopography on burrowing intensity at all but one site, okay, Arnold 2016, which is a scrub site. And then if we look at both of them, you might ask, how can it not be significant here and then have both be um, a model preferred that includes both? Basically, you can't detect the effect of the trend until you account for the microtopography. And so you could see that a lot of cases, um, a model that includes both was preferred over a model that included just one of the predictors and then over the null model. And so you could see there was actually two sites, um, Smith for the two different years, where there's a positive effect of microtopography and a negative effect um, of the trend on burrowing intensity. This shows the magnitude of the regression coefficients with 95% confidence intervals. And again, I have the same color scheme here to compare the different types of sites. Um, and what you can see here is this is the, uh, the circles here are the effects of microtopography and the squares are the trend surface. And so you can see if it doesn't overlap the zero here, that basically means that it's significant. And I'm not showing the one that wasn't significant. But we can also use these confidence intervals to compare the effects, um, say, between these flatwood sites and these scrub sites. And you can see that the effect is significantly larger in flatwoods as compared to scrub. But there's always, you know, almost for almost all the sites, there is a significant and positive effect of microtopography on, on burrowing intensity. Just to kind of show you uh, some of these sites, I don't have time to go through all of them, but um, say Smith, one of these sites where you have a positive effect of microtopography with a ne negative effect of the trend surface, what's going on? Um, so here it is on the raw elevation model. And you can kind of see here that, you know, you get high intensity, but lower intensity up in this area where that's higher elevation. And this is it um, overlaid on the microtopography. And you can see these sort of raised surfaces where you, you're seeing these burrows. If you sharpen this, you can see that it's actually a big plateau right here. There you go, I included it. Okay, so you can really see that they're really sort of um, very intensely burrowing on these, these really subtle raised surfaces that might only be a difference of a meter or two from the, the mean elevation. <clears throat> this is if you plotted it on the trend surface, and then if you actually want to look at the site from an overview, um, and apparently what's going on here is there's some pine plantation up here um, that apparently the canopy's closed and um, the, the light and, and um, temperature conditions might not be so ideal. And then there's also some pine plantation down here where you also get lower intensity. What about um, some mixed sites? So these mixed sites are somewhat interesting, um, such as Kissimmee North. Um, and you can see this sort of sandy stuff is where the scrub is. This greener stuff is the, the pine flatwoods. And uh, this is it overlaid on um, the elevation surface and then the microtopography. And what's interesting is that in this site, essentially where the high intensity of burrowing is associated with microtopography is actually in the scrub areas. Okay, so it's not just here. It's not really the flatwoods that have the raised surfaces. It's in the scrub. And they're finding these raised spots in the scrub where um, there's intense burrowing. Okay, so the elevation surface had a weak positive effect at all but two sites. So if we just look at the elevation surface alone without decomposing it, it had an effect at all but two sites, but it's weak. Um, the trend surface um, 
did not have a detectable effect at most sites. So if you just look at just the gradient and elevation, um, it, it didn't have an effect at most, uh, at most of the sites. And in fact, at a couple of the sites, it had a negative effect. And microtopography had very strong positive effect um, at all sites, um, and especially it was larger in pine flatwoods. So uh, this explains some of Tracy's data um, based on radio telemetry, where they were finding uh, females had home ranges that overlap more in pine flatwoods. Both sexes shared more burrows in pine flatwoods, and females shared more burrows in pine flatwoods. And this seems potentially to be explained by, well, they're finding these little features in the in those those forests, and they're burrowing intensively on those features, and therefore, um, you, you'd expect their home ranges to overlap more. Um, this is an interesting study by Cal that was modeling sort of occupancy, and he did find among a bunch of different predictors that he looked at that there was an effect of elevation. However, it was a weak positive effect, um, and I think that what's going on here is that if you just look at elevation using a DEM, you're missing part of the story that it's the microtopography that's really what's driving it potentially and that you might get a weak positive effect because you're getting these confounding effects of the trend surface versus the microtopography. So you, um, it's probably important that we start looking at microtopography. And then sort of one of the interesting questions is, is you know, there's all this interesting literature and uh, observations of gopher tortoises using flooded burrows and some people saying that they actually tend to find them in the flooded portion of the burrow. Um, so the question is, you know, if they don't mind flooded burrows, why are they going on these raised surfaces? And it could be that um, essentially if the burrow is completely flooded, it doesn't serve any sort of a purpose, right? They, they, it's not a refuge in any way. And it might also be kind of like digging a sandcastle in wet mud. You just can't dig a hole, right, if it's too wet. So there's lots of interesting things to look at still about um, burrow flooding and whether gopher tortoises like that situation or not. But um, it does seem like, you know, they are somehow finding these little raised surfaces that us as humans can't really detect, right, without, without a bunch of geeky, nerdy stats tricks. Um, there's a lot of people. I'm just the statistical geek on the study. Um, Tracy and Betsy and their field crew are the people who did all the hard work on the ground. I just work on carpal tunnel um, in front of my computer. <laughs> um, uh, Leandro Rosaire um, did give me... Um, I, I was missing the interaction term when I originally did my um, came up with the procedure for detrending the elevation surface, and he pointed that out to me. Um, and then also, I wanted to make sure that it was kosher um, to do this sort of a procedure where I could use the residuals um, um, and model with them. And I, so I contacted my buddy Pierre Legendre, who's like the god of numerical ecology, and he affirmed my, my approach. So feel good about that. So with that. I don't know if I have time for questions. No. All right. <laughs>